Thank you for this honor. It's wonderful to be here. We put on a civil rights symposium just last week at the University of New Mexico. <clears throat> Our keynote speaker flew in from LA. Five minutes before the keynote address, there was nobody in the room. And I said, it's okay, it's New Mexico. It's like this underground current, the kind of water source that kind of just flows under the surface. And pretty soon, it starts bubbling up. And sure enough, within 15 minutes, the room was packed. But whoever's here is here, and you just kind of just go with the flow. You know? So um, <clears throat> yesterday, we were talking about logical rhetoric and reason in the, in the public sphere. And I'd like to talk about maybe the reading between the lines of rhetoric. Suzanne Langer, in her work, uh, Philosophy in a New Key, calls attention to discursive and non-discursive acts, or what she calls presentational discourse. And there is that element of the quasi-logical that Perlman calls attention to, that somehow call, holds the universe of discourse and the public sphere together. So in counterpoint to John's paper yesterday, I'd like to focus on reading between the lines of rhetoric and the everyday discourses that helps us cohere as communities. I had a fun experience with that just yesterday and I shared that with our table last night and I'll share the story with you. Um, flying out here, getting ready, you know, you just throw everything in a suitcase and just hope everything works out when you land and I show up yesterday morning and my suitcase looks like a wardrobe soup, you know, everything all thrown in there. So I need to hang everything up. There's only six hangers in the room, so I go to the front desk and ask the very thoughtful attendant, could you provide me with some more hangers? I've got a lot of wrinkled clothes. And he says, no, we cannot give you more hangers. I said, okay. He said, I'll give you another room. And I said, wouldn't, giving, wouldn't it be easier to just to give me more hangers? <laughs> and he looks at the computer and he starts thinking, you know, and he says, no, he says, you need a jacuzzi. <laughs> now, quasi-logical argument, this is okay with me. <laughs> I went searching for hangers and I got a jacuzzi, so... The enthymeme in action, right? All those suppressed premises that we hook into and build collaboration. So being open to the serendipitous and what, is, and the, what we don't, aren't aware of in the logical realm is really important. So that reflects a lot on this paper that I'm gonna share with you today. The title of my paper is What the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement can teach us about civic literacy in the 21st century, and it does coalesce my research in Mexican-American civil rights rhetoric, as well as literacy education. <clears throat> I would call this case studies in reading between the lines, if you will. Let me get a drink of water real quick. Border anxieties continue to ignite across the country. Perturbations in the national imaginary were dramatically illustrated a year ago when several California high school students wore American flag t-shirts to Cinco de Mayo celebrations in a strange nine, post-911 American patriotic reversal. The students were expelled from school for promulgating incendiary rhetorical statements. <clears throat> Wearing the American flag was grounds for expulsion as their Latino classmates donned the colors of the Mexican flag. The rogue demonstrators violated not only good taste but the boundaries of political tolerance at Live Oak High School. Against the backdrop of the recent immigration law SB 1070 enacted by the state of Arizona, this act of public rhetoric takes on multiple layers of significance. What is particularly rich about the incident is the young men wearing the offending American symbol were Mexican-American and Anglo. 
There is not, this is not too surprising, however. Ambivalence toward immigrants and recién llegados have been a litmus test of belonging among many immigrant groups, including Mexican origin populations, for centuries. But I have to agree with syndicated columnist Leonard Pitts that the decision by the Live Oak High School administration to take a disciplinary response rather than use the moment for collective deliberation was a grave mistake. Certainly, there is a teachable moment here, not only for the students of Live Oak High School, but for us as a nation, as the immigration debate once again unravels us at our discursive seams. To understand the ideological nuances of these current political statements, we only need to revisit the 1950s Me Cold War Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement. So today, I would like for us to take a look at Cold War rhetorics of Mexican-American civil rights activists and consider what the post-World War II Mexican-American civil rights movement can teach us about civic literacy in the 21st century. There are a few still with us reading the national signposts, those who took the long view and offered a hand to draft the lar larger map of US civil rights reform. <clears throat> There are a few figures who complicate the grand narrative of the post-war civil rights era, whose voices provide contour and dimension to the flat, linear surface of history making. Vicente Jimenez is one of those rare historical figures. And this paper examines the rhetorical legacy of Vicente Jimenez and his role as organizer of the American GI Forum in New Mexico from 1951 to 1961 as a way to historicize and contextualize my recommendations for the institutionalization of a writing across communities approach to literacy education. The lessons learned from Jimenez's rhetorical career seem especially efficacious today. Jimenez's style of leadership resonated with working class Mexican American communities, and eventually bridged the World War II generation reformers of the 1950s with the Chicano activists of the 1960s. Jimenez's political impulse and rhetorical, <coughs> rhetorical imagination rested on four dimensions of democratic practice. Dissent, deliberation, dissonance, and disputation. These frame the discursive guidepost undergirding Jimenez's earliest activist work as an organizer for the American GI Forum. The rhetorical influence of Vicente Jimenez in post-World War II civil rights reform became evident to me early in my research of Mexican-American civil rights activism. Jimenez's letters, reports, speeches fill the Dr. Hector P. Garcia archives at the Bell Library in Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. Newspaper articles, and Wright House reports detail Jimenez's career from American GI Forum organizer to White House insider. Jimenez's warmth and brilliance are revealed in his measured responses, his balanced perspectives, and eloquent oratory contained in archive materials at both the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library and Hector P. Garcia Papers. Vicente Jimenez generated the most extensive body of discourse in the broadest range of genres related to Mexican-American issues in the post-war civil rights era, more than any other leader of his generation. First, let me set the stage for you for this story. Vicente Jimenez and I met for the first time in November 2002. Vicente Jimenez is now 93 years old, and he lives in Albuquerque. But we first met in November 2002 in Corpus Christi at the premiere release of Jeff Felt's PBS film, Justice for My People, documenting the life and work of Hector P. Garcia. My book, Hector P. Garcia, Everyday Rhetoric and Mexican-American Civil Rights, was released in December 2006, mapping the efficacy of this South Texas physician as a self-styled rhetor and leader of the post-World War II Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement. My current book project, Vicente Jimenez and LBJ's Great Society, 
the rhetoric of Mexican-American civil rights reform, extends the story of post-World War II Mexican-American activism and analyzes the enduring contributions of this politically generative period in US history. There's a little sidebar here worth mentioning. Soon after Vicente we met in 2002, we began corresponding with each other. Boxes of archive material began arriving at my office from Vicente. When I emailed Vicente and mentioned that I was beginning to think that my next book was going to be about him, he replied in response, I was wondering when you were going to figure that out. <laughs> so he chose me to do his book. And I'm serendipity, I had to say yes. This new volume then enlarges current scholarship of Mexican-American civil rights rhetoric by providing a full exam examination of the ways that post-war generation empowered new leadership and affected national policy change. And I would like to share with you a few is um, insights from this new research um, and then connect that then to what I'm doing at the University of New Mexico with the writing across communities. Civic action for Hector P. Garcia, Vicente Jimenez, and the World War II generation of reformers reflect many of the qualities identified by Hannah Arendt in her work, The Promise of Politics. Political action as such represents a venturing forth in speech and deed in the company of one's peers, beginning something new whose end cannot be known in advance founding a public realm, promising and forgiving one another. None of these actions can be realized alone, but always and only by people in their plurality. Civic action, or civic literacy, if you will, is our capacity to read and respond to the world through language, through symbol, through text, and to constitute our experience together and reinvent the public sphere to fabric the, fabricate the stories of the past, and to construct imaginative fictions for the future and reconcile ourselves to one another. 20th century Mexican-American civil rights history suggests that in order for social movements to affect enduring institutional change, they must get into the sinew of governing organizations. They must shape and exercise the muscle and the connective tissue of policy and practice from the inside out. It is not enough to stir a movement for social change. Active must, must mentor advocates to implement and administer institutional transformation. The influence of a social activist is therefore best enhanced and best measured by the effective and strategic placement of representatives within the dominant social structure. Jimenez and the post-war Mexican-American activists catalyzed a proactive movement that didn't wait for justice to come, but operated on the assumption that change was possible and the American system of self-governments was not only redeemable, but achievable. These values informed, also informed Jimenez's leadership style in the coming decades throughout his tenure as Commissioner of President Johnson's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Chair of the Interagency of Mexican-American Affairs, and Coordinator of the Presidential Cabinet Committee hearings on Mexican-American Affairs in El Paso, Texas in 1967. Jimenez's application of phronesis, his pragmatic engagement with the major issues of Cold War, that Cold War rhetorical situation, teleologically aligned his rhetorical career over the next two decades. The xenophobia and red-baiting discourses of the McCarthy age shaped the rhetorical situation of that 20-year period of the post-war civil, civil rights era from 48 to 68. And as she Ellen Shecker notes in The Age of McCarthyism, Cold War liberals of all ilk found themselves precariously aligned in the struggle against communism at home and overseas. Bobby Kennedy joined the ranks of anti-communist McCarthy Democrats throughout the 50s, and he was in good company. 
Many Cold War liberals, like Minnesota Senator and future Vice President Hubert Humphrey, wanted to expand the welfare state and eliminate racial segregation to protect the world from the expansion of communism. Albert o. o. Hirschman, in The Rhetoric of Reaction, Perversity, Futility, Jeopardy, calls this tactic the eminent danger thesis. Deployed throughout the Cold War era, social progressives argued for transferring resources from wealthier groups to poor populations as a safeguard against the advances of communism. These advocates asserted that civil rights reform and welfare state programs were imperatively needed to stave off some threatening disaster. The re rhetorical resources then available to Jimenez and his cadre of American GI Forum organizers were replete with the inconsistencies and fluencies of the Cold War rhetorical situation within which he exercised agency as a grassroots leader. The peculiar problem facing Jimenez in 1951 was then how to structure his arguments for Mexican-American civil rights reform out of these dissonant strands of rhetoric available within the Cold War cultural milieu. For Mexican-Americans, issues concerning citizenship and border identity established the parameters of Cold War liberal discourse, nationalist politics, and civil rights rhetoric in the 1950s. These represented the rhetorical idioms of political inclusion. So plumbing the deepest anxieties of Mexican origin groups, questions about belonging, cultural, national, linguistic, and political, were the most potent. As Topoi, these themes framed the available means of persuasion for the major post-war Mexican-American reformers. Jimenez's own predecessor, George I. Sanchez, native of New Mexico and professor of education at the University of New Mexico, exploited these common Cold War commonplaces to advance the cause of Mexican-American civic inclusion. In an October 27, 1951 letter to Hector P. Garcia, George I. Sanchez writes, quote, the Spanish-speaking people can constitute the least sponsored least vocal, and the least understood of the large minority groups in the United States. As regard to special government concern, philanthropic support, or effective group organization and leadership, this is virtually an orphan group. Because of this orphan, or stepchild, status, the Spanish-speaking people are in a particularly difficult position when it comes to solving some of the major problems which confront them." End quote. The metaphorical construction of Mexican Americans as the stepchildren of the nation, a trope directly signifying the appropriation of Mexicanos through the U.S.-Mexico Treaty of Juan Lupe Hidalgo in 1848, indexes these complex terms of inclusion under which this population has been negotiating citizenship for over 150 years in the United States. The implicit meanings of this metonymic term suggest a broad range of inequitable national relations. Extending Sanchez's metaphor, Mexican Americans were considered binational stepchildren, the collateral damage of an international divorce. As Jimenez gained recognition through the 1950s as organizer for the American GI Forum, a new voice of authority countered and complicated the uncontested position of George I. Sanchez. Sanchez had served as the national president of LULAC through the 1940s and was the founder and director of the grant writing clearinghouse known as the American Council of Spanish-Speaking People that provided support for research projects and litigation efforts related to Mexican-American issues. Sanchez had set the tone for LULAC political activism for over a decade with its focus on anti-immigration, U.S. citizenship, education, nationalism, and assimilation. Unlike the other leaders of the emerging political powerhouse behind the Ameri American GI Forum, Jimenez was uniquely positioned to change the rhetorical current of the GI Forum. <clears throat> He was not only an economist at the University of New Mexico, 
But Jimenez was a decorated World War II veteran. He was an activist. He was a citizen of New Mexico, as well as a native of Texas. He was then a ratified speaker within multiple discourse communities. Jimenez possessed a deep understanding of military, academic, business, and civic cultures, as well as deep identification with Mexican American, New Mexican, and Texan cultures. Even more importantly, Jimenez represented a counterforce to, to, to traditional LULAC ideology and rhetoric. The chiasmus of discourses and counter discourses that reconfigured the scope, the strategies, and the shape of the American GI form over the next decade, from 51 to 61, <clears throat> was then invigorated by the grassroots perspective and pragmatic leadership approach of Vicente Jimenez. As a gifted orator, writer, and organizer, Jimenez possessed many of the same qualities of his contemporary George I. Sanchez. Jimenez possessed one quality, however, that Sanchez lacked, phrenesis, practical wisdom. While Sanchez fueled the anti-wetback propaganda in Texas in cooperation with the Texas American GI Forum leaders, Eddie Dar, an attorney in South Texas, and he Dr. Hector P. Garcia, they were providing direct support for the research informing the controversial Saunders Leonard anti-immigration labor report. Vicente Jimenez, in contrast, launched a different activist com campaign in New Mexico. Vicente Jimenez conceptu conceptualized his leadership style from an inductive perspective of particular cases rather than a deductive or a more theoretical model. He employed a pragmatic epistemic approach to the construction of knowledge using inductive and deliberative process. Phrenesis, according to Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, inextricably connects the dimensions of ethos, deliberation and praxis, and purposeful choice. Or what Mary Whitlock Blundell argues, phrenesis guides the process of deliberation and hence plays an essential role in purposeful choice, which in turn is the moving cause of praxis or action. Consistent with these characteristics of phrenesis, Jimenez looked to the social realities of New Mexico and the Southwest to construct his understanding of civil rights reform and human rights activism. I'm going to give you a couple of case studies to demonstrate and illustrate how this was employed. On December 20th, 1951, Vicente Jimenez circulated <clears throat> one of his first acts of public rhetoric in the form of a letter to the editor of the Albuquerque Journal. The telos embedded within this 300 word statement thoughtfully identifies the major issues and Cold War themes motivating the formation of the American GI Forum in Albuquerque that same year. Jimenez opens his letter with this declaration. This is a letter about death. He then constructs a contrast between death in New Mexico and death in Korea. The illustrative narrative that follows describes a recent event in Lovington, New Mexico. Jimenez delineates, quote, on November 16th, the Hobbs Daily News Sun reported the death of two Mexican children from starvation. I assume they meant that the children were American citizens of Mexican extraction since it was reported that their legal residence was Yoakum, Texas, it seems no welfare funds were available for these American citizens because the law prevented disposition of funds to non-state residents. Furthermore, it seems that a nurse could not help the children because the nurse could not speak Spanish. Since when does a nurse have to speak Spanish in order to detect malnutrition? I always thought malnutrition was a health condition, not a language." End quote. Jimenez charges the welfare state and New Mexico Senator Clint Anderson with the deaths of these two children. He contrasts the deaths of the children in New Mexico with deaths of 108 U.S. Hispanic soldiers in Korea who gave their lives as American citizens. This enthymematic alignment 
seeks to establish a moral distinction between the noble and honorable Mexican-American soldiers killed fighting in battle overseas and the disgraceful and dishonorable deaths of two innocent children from starvation in the homeland. Orphaned by the US political, social, and economic system, Jimenez re recirculates the metonymic connotations implied by George I. Sanchez in his October 51 letter to Garcia. However, Jimenez relies on phronesis to persuade his audience. Jimenez deals with particular cases, not general categories. Sanchez, the venerable academic, deploys absolutes and generalizations. In contrast, Jimenez calls attention to the specific, the immediate, the issues most present and available to his audience to call attention to the global and the general. Jimenez closes the letter of protest with a critique of New Mexico lawmakers and candidates campaign for, campaigning for election and their promotion of various economic programs in the state. He argues, quote, not one single lawmaker or would-be lawmaker uttered a word about solving New Mexico's situation with reference to the children, two children that starved in Lovington. Perhaps silence means consent, end quote. Significantly, Jimenez signs his letter as chairman of the newly founded American GI Forum in New Mexico. Representing this new advocacy civic organization, Jimenez declares a new public presence in the region. The claims delineated in his letter are far-reaching. Jimenez tackles Cold War liberal issues alongside Mexican-American civil rights issues related to national citizenship, regional identity, economic disparities, heritage language, and political representation. He would take these same themes for public action six years later. Dramatic illustrating the contradiction of inclusion for Mexican-American citizens, I will examine a second rhetorical moment involving one of the foundation, foundational institutions of constitutional era US culture, the Daughters of the American Revolution. In February 1957, Art Tafoya, chairman of the Denver American GI Forum, along with Jose Ontiveros and Molly Galvan of the Pueblo chapter, reported a racist incident in Colorado to Vicente Jimenez. Their reports indicate the local chapter of the Daughters of the American Re Revolution had refused to allow a Mexican origin boy to carry the American flag at a President Lincoln Day ceremony at the Colorado Industrial, uh, Industrial School for Boys in Golden, Colorado. This was scheduled for February 12, 1957. The correctional institution was populated largely by Mexican origin boys, many of them who were born in the United States to parents who were immigrant Mexican nationals. Questions of race, national identity, and cultural belonging were at the center of this controversy. As chairman of the GI Forum, national chairman, Vicente took the lead on the issue and expressed outrage to the local and national press. He immediately fired off a telegram to the DAR, president of the national DAR, Frederick Graves, and all chapters of the American GI Forum. Within 24 hours, thousands of responses poured out in protest. Senator Dennis Chavez of New Mexico sent a telegram in rebuke, reminding public officials in Colorado that Mexican-Americans had carried the US flag at Bataan in World War II. Governor, Mc Governor McNichols of Colorado, in response, suspended all pending DAR t activities in the state. The rhetorical efficacy of this incident was clear to Jimenez. The American flag was a powerful symbol for his civic group. The metonymic conceptual overlay of the US flag onto the ethos of the American GI Forum was strategic. The rapid expansion of the American GI Forum over the past decade was the direct result of the alignment of the dominant Americanist discourse with civil rights reformist rhetoric. <clears throat> The denial by the DRR against a Mexican origin child to carry the US flag was a civil rights violation in Manon's mind, potentially as incendiary as the catalyzing event that propelled Hector Garcia and the American GI Forum into the national limelight in 1949. 
The refusal of funeral director in Three Rivers, Texas to bury a Mexican-American soldier, Private Felix Longoria, had successfully cemented the reputation of the American GI Forum as a civil rights organization only eight years earlier to this moment. So recognizing a similar exigence, Jimenez did not waste any time to act on the infraction. He stirred public debate and demanded immediate redress. The Denver Star and the Amarillo Globe Times noted that the Lincoln Day flag carrying pa pageant had been immediately canceled following Jimenez's complaint. Charlotte Bush of the Denver chapter of the DAR Patriotic Education Committee publicly defended her position, quote, I wouldn't want a Mexican to carry old glory, would you? End quote. This enthymeme, framed as a rhetorical question, was advanced by Charlotte Bush in her capacity as a DAR official. Her statement not only revealed the ethos of the speaker, but the express goals of the organization. The suppressed premises of Bush's assertion include, first, Mexican origin people are not American citizens, and second, only American citizens are entitled to carry the flag. The assertion was sufficiently damaging to the DRR, DAR that it called, Jimenez then called for immediate action from national headquarters. DAR National President Frederick Graves responded immediately by pulling the charter from the local Denver DAR. She contacted Jimenez and offered to travel to Albuquerque, New Mexico to exchange flags with the American GA Forum as an act of reconciliation. And now Jimenez had to decide how much more negative press he wanted to promote, heaping political coals on the head of the DAR. However, Jimenez chose to take a restorative justice approach. He engaged negotiations with the DAR president, and the flag exchange ceremony was promptly staged in front of the Albuquerque GI Forum building. The US flag was carried by Roberto Duran, son of New Mexico American GI Forum organizer Zeke Duran. President Graves flew in, delivered a statement regretting the incident, and delineated the action she took to punish the Colorado DAR chapter and the person who refused to allow a Mexican American boy to carry the American flag. Jimenez formally accepted the apology and the National DAR's presentation of the American flag. Symbolically, the American GI Forum raised the gift of the American flag in front of the newly constructed building that became the permanent headquarters of the American GI Forum in Albuquerque. And equally important, the event signaled the authority of Jimenez as an emerging national leader, demonstrating his prudent exercise of power and publicly resisted the stepchild status of Mexican Americans in Cold War America. In effect, Jimenez disrupted the disabling narratives advanced by early reformers such as George I. Sanchez, asserting a new rhetorical trajectory for Mexican American civil rights activism. Through his exercise of phronesis and practical wisdom, Jimenez exploited the flag raising incident toward a productive and peaceful outcome and he promoted an act of resolution through which both parties could recover esteem. The flag exchange ceremony in Albuquerque provided a public occasion within which the American GI Forum, representative of Mexican American citizens, and the DAR, representative constitutional era Anglo Americans, could regain honor. Reverence and ceremony transformed this particular drama of discord and why then is this rhetorical moment important to us today? Our current situation of national division and international polarization calls for models of democratic practice that promote dissent, engage difference, cultivate debate, and negotiate the noise of dissonance. As Hannah Arendt reminds, the promise of human freedom is realized through community by plural human beings when and only when we act politically. In a word, this is what democratized education is all about. Cultivating conditions for self-governance and rhetorical authorization. This is the key behind the Writing Across Communities initiative at the University of New Mexico. 
invigorating the public sphere, cultivating civic literacy on behalf of our most vulnerable communities, creating discursive spaces for historically excluded student populations. So who constitutes our historically student populations? At the University of New Mexico, our vulnerable communities include a broad range of student groups. Some of these may sound familiar to you. First generation college students, linguistically diverse, international students, Native American, Mexican American, African American, non-traditional re-entry student groups, economically dis disadvantaged, we are the second poorest state in the nation, physically and mentally disabled students, returning veterans and their families, political refugees, former prisoners, most of whom are disproportionately male students of color, GBLT students, survivors of hate crimes, sexual abuse, and domestic violence. In other words, I mean in nearly the entire student population of the University of New Mexico constitute the intended beneficiaries of the Writing Across Communities Initiative. So what do I mean by a Writing Across Communities model? And here's my most current and succinct definition. Writing Across Communities represents a constellation of stakeholders, locally and nationally, centered around educational principles, cultural practices, that promote the generative creative and life-sustaining ecological relationships of language and literacy to the maintenance and well-being of human communities. Writing Across Communities seeks to guide curriculum development, stimulate resource sharing, cultivate networking, and promote research in language and literacy practices throughout the nation and in support of local colleges and universities working to serve the vulnerable, vulnerable communities within their spheres of influence. Let me code shift here for a moment. The term bienestar, well-being, sums it up really nicely, I think. There are two different forms of being, of the verb being in Spanish linguistic systems. Ser is a constant state of being. Estar is a process of being. Writing across communities calls attention to the processes of being of becoming literate members and citizens of multiple discourse communities. I launched the UNM Writing Across Communities Initiative some five years ago after the chair of the department asked me to start a conversation about WAC. I don't think this is what he had in mind. <laughs> what I offer you here today is a set of principles and a set of stories, or what I call inductive moments. And I need to be honest about the organic and evolutionary nature of writing across communities. There is no blueprint for WAC communities. Nowhere in my doctoral program did I get operating instructions for mobilizing, theorizing, or institutionalizing a university-wide initiative. I've invited a number of my colleagues in the field to help create this story. Jackie Jones Royster from the University of Ohio, Barbara Johnstone, Carnegie Mellon, Keith Gilliard, Penn State, Susan McLeod from UC Santa Barbara. My friend Linda Adler Kasner says we're growing ivy at UNM. Mi compadre Juan Guerra likens the UNM white communities to rhizomes, cultivating exponentially generative nodes emanating from a single root. That's what he says. The explosive generativity of graduate student generated projects this year in the face of crippling budget cuts, however, more aptly portends a scene from the attack of killer tomatoes. WAC Communities is a work in progress. It's a set of organizing principles, and the prov provisional nature of WAC Communities is not only appropriate, it is intentional. Literacy is a fluid process, and the notion that mastering any single literacy practice, such as the academic essay, as sufficient to become an educated and engaged citizen in the 21st century is a flawed notion. But I need to be honest, not everybody is buying it. The capacious notion of WAC communities is too messy for some folks at UNM. WAC communities doesn't fit neatly into one institutional category or space. 
It cuts across the academy, engaging what I call the four Ps of the writing process. Poetics, pragmatics, polemics, and pedagogies. This protein nature of WAC communities is especially bothersome for administrators who count on fixed categories, hierarchical relationships, and quantitative outcomes. WAC community is messy because it is organic, and it's grassroots, and it's democratic. It reinvents itself year after year, and every year I think it's done, and it comes back even bigger. The intellectual engine and the rhetorical operating space of WAC communities begins and it ends with our students, not faculty, not administrators, and not curriculum per se. Our graduate and undergraduate students are the inspiration. They're the mobilizing force keeping this conversation going. When folks ask me where I find my inspiration for this embattled initiative, without a doubt, the story of post-war Mexican-American civil rights movement, and Vicente Jimenez most specifically, provides me with the necessary invisible means of support. The impetus for WAC Communities at UNM began five years ago with some really nagging questions about sociolinguistic diversity. The most significant outcomes of these past five years is that WAC Communities continues to complicate the culture of writing at UNM with questions centering on issues of language, literacy, identity, and social justice altogether. Literacy is socially constituted and is such exponentially complex. Getting college writers to master the academic essay or the research project or the lab report is just not enough. The linguistic and textual outcomes of a writing cross communities models promotes critical engagement and cultural belonging across disciplinary, cultural, professional, and civic communities. In a nutshell, the vision of UNM Writing Cross Communities Initiative is to help students cultivate communicative alacrity across the disciplines in order to promote the knowledge and understanding and ethical habits of mind for citizenship in intellectually and culturally diverse academic, professional, and civic communities. And I would like to tell you at the end of these past five years of persistent mobilization that the UN administration has seen fit to recognize, support, and promote WAC university-wide. This is not the case, however. We have no budget. We have no director, no staff, no office, no formal infrastructure support whatsoever. We do have a cool logo, and we have letterhead. And that's all you need. We have rhetorical authority locally and nationally. Some would call it social capital. I call it collective goodwill. WAC community programs and events have served thousands of undergraduate students, supported numerous graduate students, and engaged many faculty across disciplinary groups and divisions. We have cultivated an invisible counterpublic, if you will. MLK like to refer to that as the beloved community. We are currently launching six major WAC Communities events, as, as well as the new ABQ Community Writing Center, a writing center without walls, placed in public libraries throughout the city of New Mexico. We have a cross-disciplinary graduate student online journal called In Progress, and our new Writing Communities newsletter, which is on our website. Our experience at UNM suggests that WAC Communities model can serve as a catalyst to changing cultures of writing within and beyond the university if we more fully represent and respond to the range of literacy practices associated with the civic, cultural, professional, and academic experiences of our students. Our experiences building a WAC Communities initiative at UNM reaffirms my conviction that WAC can serve as a powerful mechanism for stimulating and sustaining not only a dialogue about literacy education, but a dialectic for civic engagement. First, I need to provide some context for the evolution of this initiative. The conversations evolving around WAC communities at UNM have initiated cross-departmental and cross-community discussions on civil rights, civic literacy, place-based learning, ethno-linguistic identity, and academic access. We support, connect, and enhance the intellectual life of students and faculty engaged in the academic mission of creating and circulating knowledge. 
This initiative promotes student faculty engagement through writing for benefit of diverse disciplinary, cultural, civic, and professional communities across the university and beyond. And toward these ends, we've WAC communities informed a number of interdepartmental as well as interdepartmental initiatives, such as reformulating the first year writing sequence, known as R101 and 102, the formation of a WAC Alliance, a graduate student group, the implementation of our write on workshop for first year writing students, drop in writing centers, the celebration of student writing, the WAC Civic Literacy and Civil Rights Colloquia series. Additionally, WAC Communities has supported the establishment of a university writing center, taken an active role in the Provost Diversity Committee, initiated the university-wide core curriculum task force to revise our core curriculum. My role as WAC program chair has been largely as a liaison and an advocate, connecting the local situation to the national conversation. And in practice, I am less an administrator and more of an agitator and intellectual architect. This nebulous role has not only required organizing social action behind the scenes, but finding new ways to mobilize di diverse constituencies toward a collective reevaluation, how we treat writing across the university. In this ever-changing game of role shifting, I have served as program chair for the UNM Civil Rights Symposia. We foregrounded African American, Mexican American, Native American civil rights issues, as well as sexual justice issues. Our 2011 Civil Rights Symposium was held just last week on mental health and social justice. My graduate students and I have coordinated the university-wide events to celebrate landmark events in US civil rights reform and to call attention to current social justice issues. The responses for 2007, 2008, 2009, 2011 events have exceeded our imagination. Hundreds have filled our sessions. We have practiced the deliberative ethics of peaceful social engagement. I have seen meeting rooms gushing over with students from high school to graduate school. One vintage faculty panelist for our 2008 Civil Rights Symposium remarked that the event reminded him of the sit-ins at UNM in 1968. We're doing whack with a difference. I was pointedly reminded of the civil rights history your community shares here at Texas A&M Commerce when I flew into Dallas a couple of days ago. Like you, I have faith in the deliberative processes and the generative possibilities of community engagement that promote healing, justice, and social connection. New Mexico has its own legacies of injustice, hereditary privilege, and racism that we must continually address through education. Rudolfo Anaya, Chicano writer and author of Bless Me Ultima, calls New Mexico a spiritual corridor. Certainly, the collective memory of dispossession remains etched, like the petroglyphs of Chaco Canyon, by lines of convergence as well as conflict between old world and new world cosmologies in New Mexico. The indelible lines of colonization impacting indigenous peoples as well as European, Christian, Jewish, Muslim communities endure here, painted across history with the blood of conquest. And the myth of la convivencia and la limpieza sangre, or myths of racial purity, blood purity, is alive and well in New Mexico and in the Americas. And these are narratives we cannot ignore in the process of literacy education. The challenge then is how to engage these narratives in a productive and transformative way that doesn't reaffirm narratives of victimization and promulgate disabling fictions. And I think we can look for further answers in other places, like here at Texas A&M Commerce, and especially in the discourses of the post-war Mexican-American civil rights movement. Thank you so much.